Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Ani Pomo. I am a Buddhist nun and the director and resident teacher of Songsan Gampo Buddhist Center of Cleveland. Every Sunday, we have these guided meditations, uh, except for the last Sunday of the month, which is family meditation, and that takes place on Zoom. So if you want to be part of that, uh, please check out the links below and um, just follow them. Best to be on the newsletter so you're totally up to date with uh, everything that's happening at Sung San Gampo. Of course, we're not at our physical center in Lakewood right now because of the pandemic, but we so we're um, holding our classes, retreats, seminars, and um, guided meditation and so forth uh, online. Okay, so uh, we want to begin with uh, bodhicitta, our bodhicitta motivation, which is the uh, wish to attain enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. So it's important to know uh, this path is um, really meant for others in a sense. Like, of course, we're working on ourselves, we're doing a meditation practice, we're trying to develop the um, various qualities like patience, uh, wisdom, generosity, and so forth. Uh, the motivation behind that is not just for our own benefit, okay? We think of the suffering of others, um, humans, animals, and beings in other realms, um, and, you know, it... it it starts something in us, you know, just like when you see on the news or on social media or what have you, you know, that there's, for example, now all those fires in California that are um, not only affecting people, which is already bad enough, but also killing so many animals. You know, when you think about all the animals that live in the forest and even in homes, you know, in business, like, um, you know, high rises and stuff, like those there's a lot of animals in there, right? Mice and insects and in the forest, of course, deer and, um, you know, birds, uh, countless birds must be dying in this um, fire. So when we think about something like that, it's not just the suffering that we consider as Buddhists, but all of the cause of suffering. So we can't deal with the cause of suffering, which is fundamental ignorance and um, which leads to uh, negative karma, which then leads to suffering. So we can't deal with that fundamental cause unless and until we are enlightened. So we want to uh, attain enlightenment uh, to help others attain that also so that um, we can all be free of suffering and its cause. So with that in mind, please try your best to generate bodhicitta as strong as you can. Um, if you, like, you're not Buddhist or really interested in being Buddhist, that's totally fine. But at least form the wish that the time we spent together this morning benefits not only us, but others as well. Okay. Then we want to take just a moment to focus on our teachers. Um, we're so fortunate to have Jigme Kensu Rinpoche, uh, Tugu Pema Wangyal Rinpoche, and Taklu Mato Rinpoche as our main teachers. Excuse me, my voice is a little strange today. So, <clears throat> you know, they are so incredibly generous. They are the embodiment of wisdom and compassion. And without them, it's really really impossible actually to progress on the path no matter how much we study we have to know what the teachings mean oh i'm so sorry excuse me so we have to know uh what the teachings mean and we have to know how to practice and be guided so with their help um we can really progress on the path so we just take a moment you know just to think of them with tremendous amount of gratitude and respect for their realization and also to ask for their blessings so we can understand the teachings and put them into practice as best we can. All right, so today we're going to begin the series on the six perfections, also called the six paramitas, 
also called the six transcendent perfections. So basically known by those various names. Um, and we'll have six sessions of talking about this particular topic, uh, one at a time. Um, so uh, today we're going to be talking about the first uh, paramita, uh, which is generosity. So there are three types of generosity, uh, material giving, giving the dharma, and giving protection from fear. So we'll begin with material giving, okay? So that's pretty easy to understand. That's just obviously giving material things, being generous, generous, being generous, being generous <laughs> with uh our material goods, right? Um, even giving a little bit, it providing that's all you can afford. Um, if the intention is good, the account, the account. <laughs> if the intention is good, the amount doesn't matter. Okay, it's not like if we have no money, we're supposed to just give our house to somebody, or you know. <clears throat> whatever, you get the point, so that it's in proportion to actually what you're able to do. <clears throat> so the other type of giving as far as material giving is um, our altar. So um, I will talk about more about that in future videos, but briefly we, we um, offer eight things on the altar, seven bowls of water called water torma, and each of those represent a different aspect of enlightenment, like generosity, discipline, um, and so forth, okay? And then one light. So, you know, usually offer candles in uh, um, Tibet and Nepal and in India, they offer like oil lamps, uh, and light is meant as a um, antidote to ignorance, the darkness of ignorance. Okay, but anyway, I'll talk more about that in, a, in, a, in more detail later. So when we make an altar, um, it, uh, what happens there is because water is not something, at least at this point, until we start to really run out of water, um, it's easy to give, right? So we have no um, clinging to that. It's not like giving away our computer or our car or something like that. Okay. So why does that matter? Because when we make this offering to all the Buddhists and Bodhisattvas, we are practicing, in a sense, um, generosity without clinging. So we get used to that feeling of offering without clinging. And then over time, we become able to, to do that with larger things, with, you know, money or um, objects that mean more to us than just water, okay? Um, the other thing is that altars um, uh, um, feed, like, at the end of the day, we empty those bowls of water and we put it outside, um, in a place where people don't walk. So like under a bush or something like that where people don't walk and hopefully dogs aren't peeing on it, okay? Uh, and what that does is it feeds um, non-human beings like um, what are called pretas or um, hungry ghosts, excuse me. So um, that's the generosity of uh, making an altar, okay? So then <clears throat> as far as material things go, the teachings also talk about the faults of being miserly. And um, we can see that in, in you know, it, maybe ourselves, I don't know, but it definitely in other people, um, especially when you look at, you know, very rich people. Um, Jeff Bezos, for example, who is the head of Amazon, um, you know, he has billions of dollars, like he has more money than he can even spend in his lifetime. And yet he, um, you know, it's like, what do they say here? Hold on. So I'm looking at this text. Um, there you go. Word, it's called The Words of My Fit Teacher. And um, I really recommend this text. I give classes on this text pretty much every year, um, which takes about a year to finish. I don't know what's wrong with my voice today. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I just want to read something from here. Um, 
Yeah, so when people get hold of a few supplies or a little money, they hold tight to them with a dying man's grip and use them neither for this life nor for lives to come. No matter how much they have, they still think they have nothing and moan as if they were on the point of starvation. Such behavior can create right now an experience like that of the Prater realm or hungry ghosts uh, through the effects similar to the cause. So I have actually seen, I'm so sorry, I don't know what's wrong with my voice. <clears throat> I have actually seen people like this in my own life. Um, there was a man I that uh, was the father of someone I used to work for. And he was a millionaire, you know, he really had a lot of money. And he had a um, gold colored Cadillac, okay? But he never used it. He just used to walk everywhere because he didn't want to spend the money on gas for his gold Cadillac. So that is a kind of, you know, suffering like you have all this money, but you're, you're so, you know, clinging on to it, right? That you can't even give away like a single penny, all right? So this is obviously not generosity. Then the other sort of, um, I don't know, it might seem um, unrelated, but it is related. We, we want to practice being content with what we have, okay? Provided we have, of course, enough to live and survive and be um, reasonably comfortable, right? Once we get to that point, um, you know, we don't need to get and get and get and get, okay? We don't need to have the very latest iPhone. We don't need to have the very latest computer. We don't need to have, you know, the most fashionable, most expensive clothing and all of that. Like just be, you know, we have clothes that fit us that look reasonable. You know, we have a house or an apartment that, again, is reasonable and so forth and so on. And, you know, to sort of counteract that tendency that we have to never feel satisfied. Okay? So that's also related to um, material giving and generosity. Okay, so the next thing is uh, giving the Dharma. So Dharma means of teachings in the concept in the um, context of Buddhism. Okay, so if we are qualified, so this really depends. It, it relies on if we're qualified, uh, then we should give teachings. We should give empowerments and so forth. That's being generous with the Dharma. If we're not qualified, it's really best that we just try to strengthen our own practice. Okay and just sort of <laughs> zip it, okay? Um, because what happens then is we end up making a lot of mistakes, we end up miscommunicating, um, and then it just becomes something at best not useful for others and at worst kind of harming others because once we we hear the wrong thing, it can really do, um, sort of reverse that when we hear the right thing. Okay, so it's not to say that we can't ever talk about the Dharma with our friends, but we should never like try to evangelize or, you know, try to con convert others or convince them. Okay, we just, we're doing our own thing. We're taking care of our own mind. What others do is what others do. And we should actually have respect um, for what they believe if it's different from what we believe. It's not our business, you know, to try to make everybody believe what we believe. On the other hand, if someone asks us sincerely, then we should answer as best we can. And we should not be afraid to say, look, I don't know about that. I don't know. I'm, I'm not, you know, as educated as I would like to be. So, you know, there are things I really don't know you know, but keep asking the question and, you know, try to find somebody or, um, yeah, try to find somebody who does know. But, you know, we might have a friend who says, look, I, I hear you're studying Buddhism. I hear you're practicing. Um, what's that about? You know, then you just do your best to answer that, you know, and 
if it's helping you, then also say, you know, it's really helping me. And, you know, I don't know if you're interested, maybe you want to watch these videos or maybe you want to learn to meditate, you know, and just see for yourself. Don't put pressure on them, even if they ask you, okay? Um, so that's if someone asks you sincerely. If someone asks you just to fight with you, then just don't answer at all, you know? Like, um, I know a couple of born-again Christians, okay? And they ask me sometimes, um, one of them even asked me to come and speak at their church. And I knew that they were asking that to be confrontational, to try to convince me, you know, to do the opposite, right? To try to convert me to being a born-again Christian and so forth. So I just said, no, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not really interested. At, or if somebody comes up to me just in conversation, which sometimes happens when I go out of my ropes, um, <clears throat> then I say, oh, I don't really know very much. You know, I'm sorry, I can't really answer your questions. You know, I'm just a beginner. I'm just starting, you know, so I, I'm sorry. I just, I can't help you there, you know, or you can just change the subject, you know. I don't know, I'm not really interested in talking about that right now, but you know, how's your life? How are you doing? You know, what's what what kind of work do you do? Whatever. Okay. So that's anyway the subject of giving the Dharma. So that's the second one. So now the third one is giving protection from fear. Okay. So that is doing all you can to protect others, whether it's to protect their life or difficulty in whatever way that you can. So, um, you know, keeping them company, just really some, ooh, I think a bird hit the window. Uh, can you just hang on one second? I have to see if I can do something for that bird. I'll be right back. I hope it's okay. So, oh, that really went along well with that, protecting others, okay. Um, so now I'm going to read from here again, uh, giving in the, it's the first paragraph under the subtitle, uh, Giving Protection from Fear. Okay, This means actually doing whatever you can to help others in difficulty. It includes, for instance, providing a refuge for those without any place of safety, giving protection to those without any protector, and being with those who have no other companions. It refers particularly to such such actions as forbidding hunting and fishing wherever you have the power to do so, buying back sheep on the way to slaughter, and saving the lives of dying fish, worms, flies, and other creatures. For the Buddha taught that of all relative good actions, saving beings' lives is the most beneficial. Okay, So <clears throat> everyone wants to live. That's the point. Okay, All of us want to live humans, animals, all other beings, okay? That is like a really strong thing. So pardon me, if we uh, take lives or we participate in any way of the harming of others, uh, other beings, or actually of um, taking their lives, even if we are not the ones to directly do that, um, it's extraordinarily negative. Taking life is really like the worst thing that we can do because others value their lives so much, okay? So um, with this in mind, our teachers um, really kind of beg us to p please avoid eating animals and their byproducts like eggs, milk, and cheese, okay? Um, this, this activity of eating animals and their byproducts, it causes immense suffering even before these animals are killed. From the second they're born until the second they're slaughtered, they just really torture is not too strong of a word, okay? I, I'm sure that um, many of you already know about this, okay? But in case you don't, um, if you can look at really any kind of animal that is raised for food, um, 
you know, like pigs, for example, are held in these tiny, um, not really a cage, but it's like a like an enclosure with sort of pipes, okay? So tightly that they can't even move around. Like they can't even turn around. Like it's really this side and this side and front and back to the edge of their body, all right? So imagine that. Just put yourself in, in their shoes, like to that you can't turn around. Like you're just like this for your entire life. And you're, you know, I can't even, just hurts just to think about it. And then chickens who are, again, just squished together in these little cages who don't see the light of day, who are forced to lay eggs that are tens of times um, like more frequent than they would lay eggs in a natural environment. Um, and then cows who are forcefully inseminated. In fact, the um, contraption that they use to inseminate them is called a rape rack. So, I mean, and it's not too strong of a word. They are forcefully inseminated. They're held down. Their heads are in such a place that they can't, you know, back up. And then the farmer sticks their hand elbow deep, elbow deep in the cow to inseminate them. This cannot be pleasant for the cow. Then they're pregnant for nine months, the same amount of time that a human is pregnant. Then they give birth and they have a connection to that their baby, that little calf. And almost right away, the calf is taken away. And why? First of all, it hurts the mother's heart, just like it would for a human mother to have their baby taken away. And you can see this, you know, there's a video on um, YouTube of this calf being taken away in like the sort of like this little trailer in the back of a truck, like a pickup on, on the farm. And the mother's like running after it because that's her baby. She wants her baby. But humans want to drink her milk. So the baby's taken away and often killed for veal, if, especially if it's a male because they're not really useful in the dairy industry. Then the mother has the life sucked out of her, just pumping and pumping and pumping and pumping the milk. And for what? For what? So humans can have a little pleasure of milk and cheese. Like, really, and we shouldn't even be eating their milk. It can't be good for us. There's no other animal in the, the whole universe who continues to drink mother's milk. That's breast milk. That's cow's breast milk. I mean, humans stop drinking breast milk, some of them within the first year, some of them, you know, go for maybe two, three or four years. But at some point, they stop drinking breast milk, no matter how good it is for you. It's, you know, it's not. So sometimes people say, well, and this is actually what I thought for a long time before I became vegan, I was vegetarian. And um, they said, well, oh, you know, uh, it doesn't really hurt them because it's just, you know, I'm not killing them, I'm not responsible for killing them. I mean, chickens naturally uh, give eggs, so, and then cows just naturally give milk, so what's the big deal? Okay, well, the big deal is we are directly responsible for their death, all right? In the, like, in a way, eating um, dairy products is even worse than just eating meat because there's all this extra suffering that goes along with it. You know, the separation of the mother and child, the mother being, you know, having the life sucked out of her. And then after she's not giving milk anymore, they kill her for meat. So it's even worse. Okay. Um, and then as far as eggs are concerned, as soon as the um, eggs are hatched, they go through this factory process where um, the male chicks are killed. So the workers, there's like this um, 
what do you call it? Like conveyor belt. And um, there's all these, you know, those cute little fluffy yellow chickens that you see at Easter, right? They're all on there, hundreds of them. And the workers stand there and just separate them out from males and females, okay? And the females go to this other torture chamber where they're yeah, like crowded, right? And just eggs, 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 okay? And the males get crushed alive. There's just like a, a kind of turning thing. And they go from directly from the conveyor belt, crushed alive. Can you imagine that? Can you even imagine that? You can see it for yourself if you look on YouTube. And the um, they're either crushed alive like that, or they're put in these like giant garbage bags that are sealed at the top and they suffocate. And if we're eating <laughs> eggs, we're directly responsible for that. And all these animals are also pumped full of um, antibiotics and other chemicals right into us. Not only that, but when we consume these things, we are in a way like consuming their suffering. Like if you talk to hunters, they say that like an animal that is killed unawares, who has like no fear, who hasn't been, you know, running for their life, tastes a lot better than an animal who, um, you know, is being chased, has been chased. Okay. Why? Because all of that, like, um, I think, what do they call it? Like, uh, uric acid, I think. I can't remember. But like, there's this kind of adrenaline, you know, the whole body changes, just is pushed into the muscles. And that's the part that humans eat. Okay. So when we are eating um, cow flesh, right, we're eating all that fear and panic. Because when it comes time for them to be killed, you know, they're herded, they're often trucked for long distances in the heat without water or in the freezing cold. Then they're like let up these things and then they're um, lifted by one leg. So take your dog or your cat and pick them up by one leg and see how they feel. Then slit their throat. Come on. Come on, you guys. You can't think that that's okay. Just because we don't see it doesn't mean it's not happening. Just because we go to the store and all the meat is there very, you know, nice and it's styrofoam and plastic wrap and it looks very clean or the eggs are all lined up so sweetly, you know, that doesn't mean that it doesn't come from torture. And as long as we're buying that stuff, we're directly responsible. And according to the teachings, we get the same amount of karma as the person who killed that animal or made that animal suffer. So that's why our teachers say, please, please stop this practice of eating animals and their byproducts. Okay. It's so easy now. That's the other thing, like, it's not hard. Like, when I became vegetarian, it was probably 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, yeah? So at that time, it wasn't that easy, you know? There weren't that much, there wasn't that much in the grocery stores. A lot of um, restaurants didn't understand. If you said, I'm vegetarian, then they said, oh, do you want some fish? I'm like, no, fish is not a plant, you know? Um, and sometimes, uh, speaking of that, sometimes people think, oh, fish are okay, you know, they don't feel pain. That's bull. They feel pain. It's scientifically proven that they feel pain. Or some people say, well, I just fish and then I let them go. It's not so bad. Okay, you know, definitely it's better than killing them. But you're still causing them a lot of pain. They have nerves in their mouth. So... And we make them suffer, you know. We put, first of all, this huge, you know, hook that goes through their, otherwise we wouldn't be able to lift them, right? So it goes through their lip. Then we lift them out of the water and they can't breathe. You know, imagine someone putting a, a you know, some a hook through your lip and then holding your head down underwater. 
but they let you go, so it's okay. You guys, you have to think about it, even if you don't want to think about it, because you think, I don't want to change, you know. Uh, you know, I don't, oh, I love my steak, you know, or whatever, chicken, it's so good. Oh, eggs, oh, cheese, I can't get rid of these things. I can't, you know, yes, we can. Like, I ignored the eggs and cheese thing for a really long time because I really like eggs. I still like eggs. If I could eat eggs, I would eat eggs. You know, if it didn't cause any suffering, right? And cheese is very good. Cheese is also addictive. And you can read up on that too, if you don't believe me, okay? But you know what? Plant milks are also really good. I have a, like a frother, an electric frother. I put soy milk in there and it makes beautiful frothed soy milk that I use in my coffee every morning. There are now really, really good uh, vegan cheeses that are that rival um, ordinary cheese. And also even the burgers have gotten so much better, you know, beyond burger and this kind of thing. Uh, false turkey, you know, lots and lots of stuff. All that stuff is processed. True. And it's expensive. Also true. Okay. But, you know, we just do those things once in a while, then we're not really spending a lot of money. And especially at the beginning, I think it's useful to uh, have those kind of things because we're used to eating um, animals and their, their byproducts, you know? So um, in the beginning, oh, there's even something called vegan egg. This I love. It's also very expensive, unfortunately, but I don't use it that much. But it makes a scrambled egg that is so good. And really, I think even meat eaters would have a hard time uh, or, or vegetarians would have a hard time distinguishing between vegan egg and regular scrambled eggs. So anyway, very easy, very, very easy. All kinds of restaurants now understand what a vegan is, and they try to, um, you know, have at least one thing on the menu. Um, there's also really, really good vegan ice cream. Ben and Jerry's, for example, unbelievable. Seven layer coconut, so good. Okay, so what are you giving up? What are you giving up to uh, turn to a plant-based diet? Nothing but causing the suffering of animals, causing their suffering and their death, okay? For what? That's the other thing. Like, let's say I can't give up cheese, I can't give up meat, whatever. But that's an animal's life for a few minutes of pleasure on our tongue. It's really not an even exchange, you know? All right, so I'm done with my big lecture, <laughs> okay? But please, please consider it. If you're not already vegan, please consider it, okay? And really look into the details. There's an article that I wrote, brief article that I wrote called Why Vegan on our website. It's in the left-hand column. Uh, under resources. So that has a lot of links and other information and stuff if you're interested in that. So um, check it out if you want to learn more. Even if you don't change, at least you know what's really happening and what's behind uh, your choices to eat those things. So please try. Okay. All right. So now uh, we're going to do some meditation. Okay. We're going to start with uh, just mindfulness breathing practice, and um, then we'll do some uh, practice of exchange or tonglen, okay? So uh, mindfulness of breathing practice is just to take the posture of meditation, which I'll explain in a second. Focus on the sensation of the breath, you know, just coming in and out of your nose, and try to maintain your focus on that. And just let your thoughts come and go without engaging in them. That's it. It's very uh, simple, not necessarily easy, because we have a really strong uh, habit of being distracted. But that's why it's called a practice, right? So we're practicing awareness in the present moment, here and now. All right? So posture. If you're sitting on a chair, just have your feet flat on the floor. If you're sitting on the floor, 
uh, just cross your legs in whatever position is most comfortable for you, okay? The rest of the instructions are exactly the same. So you want your hands in one of three positions, whichever is more comfortable for you. Either palms down on your knees, palms up, resting one on top of the other in your lap, or with your like fingers on top and your thumbs touching like that in your lap, whichever is most comfortable. Okay? Then uh, your arms should be relaxed. So you're not sort of holding them out. You're not holding them in. Just relax. Back is straight. Most important thing is that your back is straight. Okay? Back of the neck is also straight. And if you do that, you'll see how your back, your spine like automatically straightens. Mouth is closed, but relaxed. Tongue resting on the roof of the mouth, breathing through the nose. The eyes should be open and looking down about halfway. So if you look just straight ahead and then you lower your eyes about halfway, unfocused gaze, just relaxed. Bring the focus to the sensation of the breath at the end of the nose, okay? Just do that for a moment. So we're trying to keep continuous awareness of that in a very relaxed way, allowing the thoughts to come and go without getting lost in them, okay? That's it. Just maintain awareness of the breath. As soon as you realize you're distracted, which is bound to happen for all of us beginners, um, just bring the mind back. That's it. All right. So let's start there. I'll ring the gong to start and also to finish. Okay. We'll just do this for about 10 minutes or so. Okay. Your body should be as relaxed as possible while maintaining the posture. Your mind should be as relaxed as possible while maintaining awareness of the breath. Allow everything into your mandala. Okay. Sounds, sensations, but mostly focusing on the breath, allowing the thoughts to come dwell, disappear, followed by another, 
that arises, dwells, and disappears, and on and on, and you just keep focused on the breath. So now we're going to do the practice of tonlen or the practice of exchange <clears throat> in brief. This practice is meant to 
uh, increase our natural compassion. Uh, and we do this through taking on the suffering of others in the form of gray smoke and offering them our happiness in the form of white light. I'll walk you through it, okay? Um, but uh, before that, I just want to say there are four um, types of individuals that we start with in the third stage. Uh, someone we love, someone who is neutral to us, someone we dislike, and ourselves, okay? Um, so last week we did someone we love, so today we're going to do uh, someone who is neutral to us. So neutral um, actually has a, a sort of slightly negative connotation um, because uh, it, it's kind of how we categorize people in general are sort of like, dislike, couldn't care less. So it has that kind of couldn't care less, like I don't, I don't really care. You're not serving me. You're not harming me. So, p -p -p -p, okay. So that's the category we're going to work on today because we want to um, not, we want to avoid just not caring about people or not seeing them as real human beings, you know, like you often see in retail or, you know, the service industry, people kind of, you know, treat those, you know, wait staff or retail workers like, they were not people, okay? So, um, and also, you know, vast majority of people we come in contact with on a regular basis are in this category of, I don't know you, I don't care, okay? Um, so, uh, all right, so let's begin the practice. Okay, so we start this practice by once again, just bringing the mind back to the breath, taking a moment to rest in that, and then we rest the mind. That means we're not trying to concentrate on anything. We're not distracted. We're just letting the mind be as it is, okay? So I will ring the gong again. Uh, just listen to the sound as long as you can hear it and let your mind rest. Now imagine in your heart center, which is the center of your chest, a very bright white light like a shining star with light going in all directions. Then consider that you're breathing in gray smoke, hot, dark, and heavy, and all of that smoke dissolves into the white light in your heart center. Until there's not a single particle of smoke left, there's only light. Now consider that you're breathing out that white light through all the pores of your body. The light is cool, clean, clear, very bright, going in all directions. Now imagine in front of you someone that is neutral to you. So this can be like a neighbor, like oh, it ideally should be um, someone who you at least recognize, especially in the beginning of doing this practice. So like a neighbor, distant relative, um, a work colleague, your mail carrier, like this kind of category. So just picture that person in front of you. Okay, now the first thing that we want to do is to um, just consider the fact that this person is a full human being just like you are. They're not just that role to you as neighbor, uh, mail carrier, what have you, okay? They have a history, a family, 
um, people who love them, people who dislike them, uh, um, you know, joys, sorrows, hopes for the future, sickness, all kinds of things, just like we do. It's a full human being with a full life. And then we want to consider how we're the same, you know, in a, in a few really fundamental ways. Uh, all beings want to be happy. So just like us, that person wants to be happy. Just like us, that person wants to be free of suffering. And just like us, that person suffers nonetheless. So then we want to consider the ways this person might be suffering, okay? We don't know them personally, so, you know, we might, we probably don't know exactly how they're suffering, but let's imagine, right? Maybe they're sick or have some other kind of physical difficulty. A lot of times people can be really sick and look fine, at least when we see them, right? Uh, maybe they have mental or emotional difficulties like depression or anger or addiction or mental illness or whatever. Maybe they're anxious about money or, you know, having trouble with their families or at work. Okay. So we just consider all the possibilities of ways this person might be suffering we generate then compassion for them, just like we would for someone that we love who is suffering. And then we consider that all their suffering, whatever it is, takes the form of gray smoke, hot, dark, and heavy, and it leaves them and it comes to you. Without any hesitation, with an open heart of compassion, you breathe that in through all the pores of your body and all of that smoke dissolves into the white light in your heart center. Every single particle dissolves into the white light until there's nothing but white light. Then you offer this person your own happiness, your own good fortune, anything at all that they may need to feel happy and free from suffering. And that takes the form of white light, cool, clean, clear, very bright. And you breathe out this white light. And when the light touches this person, you see all of their suffering and anguish just completely disappears. They have a look on their face of great relief, deep joy and happiness, peace. And you feel really joyful for being able to do this for them. Now we do the same for all sentient beings, imagining them all around us in every direction as far as the horizon, as far as the eye can see. In front, to the right, behind, and to the left. And you'll notice that the vast, vast majority of all these sentient beings fit that category of being neutral to us, right? So it's really good practice because it allows us to have boundless love and compassion. So we consider them all, consider their sufferings of body, their suffering of mind, their situational sufferings. All of that takes the form of gray smoke, hot, dark, and heavy. It leaves them, it comes to you with a great deal of openness and compassion. You breathe that in through all the pores of your body, every single pore of your body, and it dissolves into the white light in your heart center until there's no more smoke left, even the smallest particle, there's only light. Then you offer all of these beings without exception, your own happiness, your own good fortune, your wealth, everything and anything that they may need to be free of suffering and adding to that the wish that they attain full and complete enlightenment. And all of that takes the form of white light, cool, clean, clear, very bright. You breathe that out through all the pores of your body. And when the rays of light touch them, each individually, their suffering just completely lifts off of them. 
and disappears like fog in the morning sun. And you see them breathe a sigh of relief as if a great weight has been lifted off their shoulders. They feel very happy at ease and you feel really joyful for being able to do this for them. Now you let go of the visualization altogether, gently bringing the mind back to the breath. Just have a gentle, relaxed awareness of the breath to bring and keep the mind in the present moment, here and now. Okay, so now we are going to do the um, closing prayers, which you can join in or you cannot join in, whichever you prefer is perfectly fine. We begin with the um, long life prayers for the Dalai Lama, um, our teachers, and any Lama that we have received teachings from. These we just do in Tibetan. Um, if you want to follow along in Tibetan, that's fine. If you want to just read the English, also fine. Okay. Kanri wa we ko we shin kam su pendan de wa malu juwe ni chin re si won den sin gyam so yi sha pe ga ga ba tu ten gyo shi. Om swasti chik me rab jam se yu chin lap ki ken se du ka vun se nu den chop. Sapsumishi doje ta ten chin ten drum and bay chin eta shin show. Om swasti se la kyam su chin lap ten jun e nun sin tak se yu tu pe ma wong. Samsum na dre yu po ta ten e. Lab chen ten de shi ten tai ke shu. Lama kung kam sam po so wa deb cha tu ku se ring wa so wa deb. Chi ne ta shin ke pa so wa deb. Lama dan re wa me pa ching ki lo. I'm not sure if I told you, but there's a link for this in the um notes description box below. It's called Closing Prayer. So if you want to bring them up, um, you should do that now. Now the second page, we say the first one in um, English and Tibetan, and the next three just in English. And then we say the uh, hundred syllable or Vajra Sattva Mantra uh, one time. By this merit, may all attain omniscience, may defeat the enemy wrongdoing from the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death, from the ocean of cyclic existence, may I free all beings. So nam di tam che sik ba ni tom ne ni be dra nam pam che shing ke ga na chi ba no tru ba ye si pe tso le dro a dro a sho. May Bodhicitta, precious and sublime, arise where it has not yet come to be, and where it has arisen, may it never fail, but grow and flourish ever more and more. As long as space endures, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain and dispel the miseries of the world. Ever absorbed in the display of divine forms and primordial awareness, appearance, sound, and perception in the state of divinities, mantras, and dharmakaya. May I, inseparable from the practice of the profound and secret great yoga, attain within the essence of mind the state of one taste. 
Om Padra Sarpa Samaya Manupalaya Padra Sarpa Tenopa Tishta Dritto Mebawa Sudokayo Mebawa Supokayo Mebawa Anurato Mebawa Sawa Sidi Me Prayatsa Sawa Kama Sutsame Tritam Shri Yang Kuru Hung Ha 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 Ho Bhagawan Sawa Tata Gata Padra Mame Munsa Okay, so uh, now we have some time for question and answer. If you like, you can just put your um, answer there in the chat box, and I will do my, I mean, not your answer, your question in the chat box, and um, I will do my best to answer it. But um, you need to be kind of quick about it because I don't wait that long. Uh, I don't wait that long. Just a few moments, okay? So I'm waiting. So if you have a question, uh, please go ahead and ask it. Question about anything. I don't see a question. No questions. Okay. All right, so uh, thank you very much for joining me this morning. Um, I really enjoy these uh, sessions together. Um, just to let you know a couple things, um, we, we have started our regular programming again. Um, please do sign up for the newsletter. There's a link below, um, and that will keep you totally up to date on everything we're doing. Um, we will be having some new classes uh, in a few weeks, I think, maybe five weeks or so. And um, also, we, sometimes we have weekend seminars, weekend retreats, and things like that. So you definitely want to uh, be in the loop about that. So do sign up for that. If you're able to give a donation, there's also a link for that. It really helps us. Um, although we are not in our center anymore, unfortunately, we still have to pay rent and we have to pay utilities and insurance and so forth. So any amount you're able to give um, would be so, so appreciated. Um, so once again, thank you ever so much. Um, I really enjoyed our time together. Just seeing. Oh, you're welcome, Angelina. Okay, so uh, thanks again, and um, I hope to see you soon. Okay, bye-bye.